So can you hear me okay or is it too loud? Anyways, yeah, the picture up there is um, Rebecca Fife, um, her daughter Prairie a long, long time ago in the woods in Illinois since uh, there was a question about that. Okay, so um, thanks so much for the introduction, uh, for uh, the introduction, Maxine, and away we go. So the presentation tonight will be about uh, interesting stories about interesting fungi out in the world, some mushroomy stuff and some non-mushroomy stuff. A lot of it's gonna be based on some tales from a book that I just published uh, recently, which you'll see lots of shameless ads for all throughout. And um, so let's get started. So um, we'll begin the story on sort of a, a, a downer note. Um, as everyone's aware, the environment is uh, rapidly changing right now. There's global climate change and it's affecting um, pretty much all aspects of life. Pretty much all publications and TV shows and things like this are constantly covering uh, this sort of situation. Fungi Magazine that I publish is no different. We've had lots and lots of articles on it. In fact, um, just uh, about a year ago, we had a special edition devoted to it, and this is the centerfold from that special issue on global climate change. There's no possible way you can read any of the little text here, but what this shows is each one of these little vignettes here, um, climate change, uh, forest fires, plastic pollution, uh, invasive species, et cetera, et cetera, on around this centerfold. We had several different stories in that edition written by a number of different scientists who are using fungi to fix some of these problems. So uh, sort of, it sort of started out a little bit grim, but there was a lot of uh, hope at the end of the issue that a lot of these problems, which um, many of which are caused by humans, can kind of be resolved by humans and oftentimes employing fungi as well. So in any case, that's why the title of the presentation is A Resilient Planet Needs Fungi Now. So we'll, we'll see some of these fungi in action uh, fixing problems and how fungi make for a more resilient planet is uh, shown here. By renewing and restoring and revitalizing the environment, they do this in the soil, they do this by partnering with other plants, et cetera, as, as we'll see um, throughout this presentation. So anyways, I mentioned this book and I, I have uh, books up here for sale if you, um, if find you have way too much money in your pocket weighing you down and you need to leave yourself of that. I have books. I only have one copy remaining of this one because uh, just recently I had an event and got wiped out, so I only have one left. Anyways, you can at least flip through and see what it is. Um, there's a QR code there if you want to purchase it from the publisher, which is Princeton University Press. And again, there'll be more shameless ads about it um, throughout the presentation. Some of them subliminal, you won't even know you're being pitched to so uh, just get ready. Anyways, the, the premise of the book sort of has two main themes throughout it. It's uh, much of what we thought we knew about fungi ain't necessarily so, and the second one is that much of uh, what's going on in the fifth kingdom or the kingdom of fungi is actually hidden right in plain sight. So there's a lot of little tiny fungi that are doing really big things, and some of those will be covered in the presentation as well. So, oh, here's the other shameless ad. So, um, I don't know if this um, discount code is still up and running. I haven't checked in a couple, in a few months actually. But if you go to Princeton University Press uh, and you type in the code here, discount code BUN30, you'll get 30% off. And I think it, they have free shipping as well. If it doesn't still work, um, don't, don't send me a nasty email because the book's really not all that expensive to begin with. It's only like 25 bucks. So, and I often run out and don't get resupplied quickly because frankly, I don't get a better deal on the book than you do, and they actually charge me shipping, so my, with my author discount, so that's just the way that goes. Anyways, um, uh, that's just uh, gift ideas for the holidays. Okay, so we'll start out with um, uh, some pr uh, pretty pictures of mushrooms that should be familiar to you. It's at this time of the year in the fall. Oh, by the way, how much time do I have? I have one hour, right? Maxine doesn't know. Okay, everyone's saying one hour. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll keep it to one hour. So um, it's about at this time of the year, sort of late fall, pretty much all the mushrooms in the woods are done. The hen of the woods are pretty much done. And so what that means is now you're starting to think, think about what's gonna happen in the spring. So the, the mushrooms you're probably thinking about now 
our morels and you know, they're just around the corner and everyone's getting, um, uh, anticipating them and starting to get out their guidebooks and uh, dust them off and, and get their hiking boots in order and all of that sort of stuff. So just a few pretty pictures of morels here uh, to get you excited. When you're out picking morels, it's interesting because morels have a number of relatives that are really popular in the forest that you probably don't even think about and they're closely related to them. And some of them have to do with fires. So if you're cooking morels right now at your house, it's either morels that you were lucky enough to pick and dry or, or freeze during the season, or you purchase them online. If you purchase them online, more often than not, they're this kind of morel here. This is a burn morel. And it's a black type of a morel that happens in a forest one year after a fire, and even sometimes two or three years after a fire. They live everywhere. You don't see them around here because we don't have fires, but rest assured they are in the soil, believe it or not. And we know this because every once in a while in the East or parts of Europe where there hasn't been a fire for many decades, even a century, and there is a fire, all of a sudden these things pop up. Did they just, did they sniff out the smoke and, and the, they came running and, and the spores landed there or something? No one really knew what caused the triggering of these, but it has to do with the smoke or the heat or something, right? Well, what happens is the morels are actually already in the soil. They just never, ever fruit. Or maybe they fruit like one here and one there, and you just don't know it. But uh, because they're in tune with fire, uh, after a fire, then there's a big flush of them. So it's still not entirely known how burn morels work, but some of their close relatives that are also ascomycetes, like some of these other cups that come after fires, they are a little bit better understood. So this is Geopixis carbonaria. So if you go out west in the Rocky Mountain areas or California where they have big forest fires every year and you go pick burn rails, you'll also see these other mushrooms too. Amazingly, no one ever takes pictures of them because they're just, you know, they're, they're euphoric and ecstatic and running around picking all the morels. But there's other even cooler fungi there had you been looking. And this is one of them. And so what's going on? This thing is everywhere in the forest, but you never, ever see it ever until after fire. So what's going on is a lot of these fungi seemingly live as an endophyte inside the plant and especially inside the roots. They never go through sexual reproduction. Maybe they don't need to. They just move around with the plants or they move around through the soil asexually. Then after fire, it's a, you know, it's a stressful situation. So then they go into sexual reproductive mode and make spores uh, with their fruit bodies and then start again anew. But anyways, it seems a lot of these actually work to benefit a lot of these plants that are also in tune with fires. So out west, there's Arctostaphylus and things like this that can resist fires. The fungi that are endophytic within them seem to help uh, possibly protect the plants in some way from the fire, but also jumpstart the roots that have maybe been damaged and get them going again. There's a number of different ones. Here's one from Australia that's all but totally unknown, Lacocephalum mylidae, uh, known as the stonemaker, it doesn't have the common name here. This is known as the stonemaker mushroom because it produces this big, massive, oh, grapefruit, almost basketball-sized uh, sclerotium. Uh, under the soil. It's also known as Aboriginal bread, I think, because Aboriginal uh, people in the northeast and northwest of Australia would know about these and uh, in burn areas they would collect these and uh, when you slice them open they're like a great big tuber, uh, kind of starchy and I guess maybe bland but it's um, sort of survival food. Anyways, if these things are fruiting you would notice them because the the mushroom itself is as big as a, a dinner plate. It's if you go on Mushroom Observer, iNaturalist, you'll see very few sightings of these things, super, super rare, unless there's a fire. Like there were two or three years ago, everywhere in Australia, afterwards these things fruited by the millions everywhere. In forests, people were very familiar with, they'd never seen one before ever. It was in the soil, it just never fruited because uh, fires had been suppressed. Isn't that pretty cool? Has anyone ever heard of this mushroom before? So it's super uncommon, unless there's a fire, then it becomes really common. So stuff like this is, is out there. What it's doing, we don't really know. But it probably helps, as I mentioned just a minute ago, probably helps with a lot of trees and other plants that are fire resistant or, or pyrophilic, as the term is, to get a jump start uh, after a fire. And likewise, little seedlings that are um, the offspring of pyrophilic plants. A lot of different conifers have cones that don't open until after they've been burned. Um, 
serotonous cones. So they're very uh, heavily covered with wax. After a certain amount of heat, the wax melts off and then the cone opens and then there's a nice seed bed. Well, these fungi are in the soil and quickly partner with these trees and become a mycorrhizal partner and help give them a jump start. We know this because people are starting to study um, these sorts of fungi because they're useful to get a jump start on forests after a fire. This is the scientist Camille Stevens Ruman. She works at Colorado State University and a lot of big fires in Colorado, and she's one of the world's authorities. She's spoken at the Telluride Mushroom Festival several times, um, and so she studies how um, using these fungi, maybe inoculating seed, seedlings uh, for, for uh, planting post-fire can give them a jump start. This is uh, really, really important because after a fire comes through and burns everything off of the soil, the soil's now denuded and bare and then can wash away and now you have no topsoil. So then you really set the forest back uh, a long, long period of time unless you can get uh, plants going and, uh, and get the soil sort of held in place. Okay, so if there's one other theme of, uh, of my book, it's uh, this Haida, uh, Pacific Northwest people's mantra, everything depends on everything else. And uh, when you start looking into fungi and their relationships with animals, plants, insects, all of these sorts of things, uh, this sort of um, comes up again and again. So is everyone here from the Missouri Mycological Site or no? Because I see new faces. Okay, because I've, I've done lots of lectures with, uh, with the moms. So are some people like totally new to fungi and you really don't know that much, but you're, you're a curious beginner. Okay, so there's lots of people are holding their hands up kind of like this. So, okay, perfect. So a uh, few basics on uh, fungi that we'll cover right now just to kind of get you jump started into what's, what's going on. Um, fungi are eukaryotes. What are eukaryotes? So all life on the planet is either prokaryote like bacteria or eukaryote like everything else. So everything is, all living things are made of cells. If you're not made of cells, you're not living. So viruses won't be talked about because viruses are not made of cells. So uh, prokaryotes have a very simple single cell that doesn't have membrane-bound organelles, no membrane-bound nucleus, et cetera, et cetera. A very simple single chromosome. Eukaryotes, all other life like us, animals, plants, fungi, and protozoans, all are eukaryotes, so they have a much more complex cell with membrane-bound organelles. Many of these organisms, eukaryotes, are single-celled, many, many are multi-celled. Fungi can be both, but they're for sure eukaryotic. They're also very, very diverse uh, and, and inhabit all, all parts of the planet wherever any sort of life can be, uh, believe it or not. And then the other thing about fungi that's really exciting to me personally is that most of them are probably undescribed and probably not even known. And we know this because we get uh, little uh, teasers all of the time when people do environmental DNA sequencing and find there's lots of DNA in the soil from all kinds of fungi and those sequences can be uh, compared to libraries of DNA all around the world. So we know it's fungal DNA, but we don't know what it is. And it's from fungi we just can't culture, so they've never been seen, and maybe they will never be seen. So we know that there's lots and lots of fungi out there. Probably most fungi on the planet we have never seen and don't have a name for. And so new species are being described all the time. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so extremely diverse. So when you think of fungi, you think of nice, warm, moist parts of the planet like uh, temperate forests around here, the area between your toes, et cetera, et cetera. But fungi can be anywhere, including very, very dry areas. In fact, believe it or not, and this would probably be a surprise even to the, the people that know mushrooms in here really, really well, fungi actually dominate the life forms of the really dry areas on the planet. Believe it or not, it's, it's hard to imagine. They might not be fungi like you would recognize, but for sure they're fungi. So this uh, top picture here is a scene from Antarctica where it's extremely hostile, extremely cold most of the year, very windy and drying, and really intense UV radiation. It's uh, one of the most hellish places on Earth, uh, except for the fact that it's also very, very cold. So in this view here, you see what looks like a desert, with lots of rocks and maybe one type of a plant, kind of a scrubby type of bush, and that's about it. If you went around collecting everything you saw that was living in that field of view there, you would probably see no birds, no mammals, no worms, you know, a lot of these big groups of organisms, no trees. You would probably see maybe one or two or a few types of insects maybe, and that's about it. But believe it or not, the dominating life form in that view is fungal. 
where is the, the fungi? Well, to be out in the open and exposed would be devastating, and that's why you don't see a lot of life there. So inside these rocks, these porous rocks, that's where the fungi are. If you went and picked up these rocks and broke them open, you would find colored bands, a dark band, and below that, a green band. And these are fungi. These are a type of lichen fungi that's called endolithic within rock. That's what that means. And they're everywhere in these Antarctic areas. Has anyone ever heard of these before? No one ever even seen them before until, I don't know, like a couple decades ago. Believe it or not, this is like one of the most common life forms on the planet. And no one knew it was there. Isn't that wild? They're just under the surface of the rocks, so they're protected from uh, the very intense UV. They're protected from drying winds, et cetera, et cetera. But they're not so deep in the rock that they don't get some of the light. And so this top band of lichen here is very dark and melanized, which the melanin in these lichens protects them from the intense UV radiation. Just like melanin in our skin, in other animals, in bacteria, lots of organisms have melanin. And then below that layer is this green photosynthetic layer of lichen too. So these two different groups live um, together and they're all over the planet. So pretty cool. So um, back to some more um, fungal basics. So we, we said what type of cells they have, eukaryotic. Fungi are saprobes and de decomposers. If you've learned anything at all in school about fungi during probably the like half of the lesson in biology where they covered fungi and then they quickly got back to plants and animals and stuff, what you learned is that fungi rot things. So, and isn't this great because without fungi on the planet, all of the uh, dead and dying trees and animals and all of this stuff would pile up and, and quickly bury us, which seems kind of preposterous. Uh, but at the same time, there's a lot of good evidence that this is totally true. Um, not many organisms can break down woody debris, the cellulose and the hemicellulose and the lignin of trees. And we know this because um, as these plants came to dominate the planet and as they died, this stuff really did pile up. And in fact, that's what led to fossil fuels. And then there's a, a, a time period when wood rot fungi evolved on the planet and could break this stuff down. And we don't see any fossil fuels like petroleum and natural gas forming really so much ever since that happened. So people that can dig down through layers of soil, you can actually see a band where wood rot fungi uh, appear, first appeared on the planet. And in this band, there are spores of these wood rot fungi. And all of the layers above that, there's the spores of these same fungi. Below that, there's no wood rot fungal spores. And that's also where you see below that band, the layers that have uh, fossil fuels. So isn't this great that fungi break down stuff? Turns out what you were told was not really true. <clears throat> While some fungi do break down uh, things and rot things, the vast majority do not. <clears throat> the vast majority are biotrophs, and we'll get to them in one second. But I mentioned how fungi are pretty unique in that they can break down woody material cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and really nothing else can. But surely you've seen animals like uh, ruminants, cattle, uh, termites, eat, seemingly eating wood. What's going on there? Well, they're not, they're eating it, but they're not digesting it. They're using other microbes to break it down. And more on that in a second. In any case, uh, how wood rots is actually pretty amazing, and it's the, the subject of a lot of research. So that fungi can seemingly break down wood and no other organisms can. There's even more to it than that. It's so difficult to break down that fu even fungi can't break down both cellulose and lignin. Some groups can break down one part of the, the woody material and others can break down the other part because they're these big long chains of these uh, molecules with a lot of bonds and it's, it's apparently really tough to break down. So when you're walking through the forest, you've seen rotting wood before, right? You've seen wood that looked like this that was kind of brown and blocky. And you've also seen wood that was like white and stringy. You've for sure seen this. And if you came upon this well-rotten wood, you probably thought, oh, it just looks like this because whatever kind of tree that is, when it rots, it falls apart this way. The wood looks brown and it looks blocky and it falls apart. And this other kind of tree that I saw looks like this, well, that's just what it does. That actually really doesn't have anything to do with it. Um, so you would have been wrong in assuming that. The reason it looks like that is because of the fungi that got to it first. So it, it typically conifer wood breaks down in this form and leaves behind uh, brown rot, but not always. And very often hardwoods break down this way and leave this white rot, but, but not always as well. 
the reason, again, is entirely uh, the fungus. So if you're uh, really into mushrooms, you would recognize the names of some of these brown rot fungi because they're familiar to a lot of us, like Fomitopsis pinicola and Felina species, Litoporus, the sulfur shelf mushroom, Thales schweinitzii, the uh, Dyer's polypore. These are really common uh, wood rot fungi. They're all uh, shelf fungi, polypores, and that's what they're doing in the forest is breaking this sort of stuff down. When they're a brown rot fungus, they basically gobble up the, cell the cellulose, leaving behind the brown uh, lignin, which is kind of the glue cement material that, that holds cells together. So that's left behind and le leaves this sort of a blocky form. Eventually stuff will come along and break that down as well, or at least partially. Um, it's believed that the reason most soils are brown is because there's a lot of lignin left behind that nothing uh, really ever seems to break down. The white rot fungi, sort of the reverse. These fungi come through and break down the, the lignin and also the cellulose somewhat. It's thought that maybe uh, some of the cellulose that's partially broken down by white rot fungi is maybe just to get it out of the way so they can get at the lignin, uh, which is a, a nice food source that not many other things can um, digest. So while these fungi here, brown rot fungi, are all basidiomycetes, um, the white rot fungi, there's basidiomycetes as well as some ascomycetes. So mushrooms that do this sort of rot that are familiar to us would be things like um, uh, armillarias, which are honey mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, uh, ganodermas, uh, trimedes like turkey tail, and then some uh, ascomycetes like dead men's fingers, the xylaria, and pizizas and chlorosaboria. If you see uh, two names up here that are in color, it's because I'm gonna show you a little bit more about them in one second. So Felinus, we can go to first. So this is Felinus tremuli on, uh, this is on aspen, so it's on trembling aspen, so that's why it has this name, Felinus tremuli. You've probably seen this before, or if you didn't, it's because it's kind of well camouflaged. When it's on the side of uh, aspen trees, where it grows, uh, it looks kind of like the uh, branch scars on the tree. So it's kind of cracked and, and brown. If you peeked underneath, you would notice, well, it's not just a scar. This is where the spores come out, the, the hymenial surface of this polypore. Otherwise, you might walk right by and not even notice it. So what's going on here? So it's living inside of this tree and doing its business. And in fact, it's mycelia. Uh, could you know span the entire length of the tree inside the middle? We, we don't know. All, all you know is that it, when it's time to reproduce, it produces this shelf on the on the outside of the tree. If we were to go on the inside side of the tree, this is what you would see. So if you cut one of those conks off the side of the tree, here's what you find: the evidence of brown rot decay. Right. So. Um, leaving behind this sort of uh, brown blocky material. But that's not really what I wanted you to note. The other thing that's even more interesting about this fungus is the, are these black lines in here. So this type of a fungus causes um, this discoloration of wood called spalting. You've probably seen spalted wood before. If you're into woodworking or you have a friend that's into woodworking and you've seen uh, furniture, cabinets, bowls, guitars, whatever, made of like bird's eye maple, curly maple, stuff like that. Yeah, there's no such thing as bird's eye maple or curly maple. Those are maple or some other type of wood that has all these black lines. So what's going on with the black lines? Um, oh, so here's some other examples too here. Um, our very good friend, Joe McFarland, who many in the room knows, uh, he's really into spalted wood and making things from spalted wood, so he made this pipe for me out of some really pretty uh, maple. And this really shows better than this shot here uh, what I want to explain. So what's going on here in this wood is the fungus is moving out of the initial infection site and into uh, living or maybe it's recently dead material in the heartwood of the tree. And the uh, advance of the hyphae is where this black line is. And anything inside of this black zone, so you have to think in like three dimensions. So the fungus moves in three dimensions and like walls off a column of the wood. It is, and now uh, this melanin that, take, that happens, this melanization, this black, that prevents attack from chemicals from the tree, from other microbes, etc. So it sort of walls off this area and is now protected against all, or, all of the result from microbes or the tree. Now the wood inside here is for that fungus and that fungus alone to use as 
food. And you can tell this in this pipe here because the wood inside of that spalted zone is very light colored. It's been bleached by the action of, of breaking down the wood. It'll take a long time before it falls apart, but in the meantime, the wood is changing color and you can see the action of the fungus. Some other things that happen with fungi when they attack wood is, uh, besides this blacken, blackening color from the melanin, is they can impart other colors as well. Uh, this little Ascomycete chlorosaboria, which was on the picture as being one of the white rot fungi, uh, chlorosaboria causes wood to turn kind of a green color. And that's this little piece of wood here. Have you ever heard of this stuff before, Tunbridge Ware? This is a very popular type of antique uh, woodworking from uh, Tunbridge Wells, England, from the late 1800s. Tunbridge Wells, yes, sir. I'll tell you. I'll tell you. You just hold your, keep your pants on. So, uh, so in Tunbridge Wells, England, in the 1800s, um, there's natural springs there, and I, I think there was sort of a cottage industry that started with people wanting to go to the spas there and whatever. So, of course, now you got tourists coming in. There's other things that will set up uh, trinket shops and things like this. So, woodworkers in the area that were already making this type of wood inlay, started making these little boxes called Tunbridge Ware for tourists to buy and take back. And they did this for just a few decades and then stopped. So now the price has actually gone way up because um, they're all old. And I, I, happen, I happen to have one. This is not mine. I have one that looks very similar to this. But anyways, what was really uh, interesting about this wood inlay, which was sort of learned from, by the English from the Italians. But what the English did was, was to incorporate different types of colored wood into scenes, and especially the green wood, which they called green oak. So uh, besides these geometric patterns of this wood inlay, they might have like a woodland scene. Wherever the foliage of the plants were, they would use this green oak. Uh, for animals and things, there's type of, of a, a pink stained fungus. And religious icons also have these. If you are into religious icons in churches, there maybe is a triptych behind the altar. They'll have scenes like this made with wood inlay in different colors or different kinds of wood and also the different stained wood. So Ken asked how to get the wood that's stained and still intact and not falling apart. Well, the wood gets colored by the fungus right away, just like that spalting did in, that, in, that, in the pipe here. This is still uh, completely intact to the point where it can be uh, worked by a woodworker. Um, but the trick was the uh, woodworker had to be friends with someone that knew about fungi in the forest. And this person could go out and, and find this uh, wood that was attacked by the fungus uh, by virtue of the little tiny fruit bodies, which are really not all that uh, often apparent on the wood. They're not out all that often, and they're super tiny, and they're often on the underside. So the woodworker had to have a, basically a mycologist or um, a mushroom guru to find this sort of stuff, and that was the key to their success. So there were only a few of these people at the time that knew about this type of wood and how to find it, so it was a, a special thing that they could uh, put together in these uh, Tunbridge ware. And to my knowledge, in, in England, this was about the only wood that would incorporate this, this sort of stuff. Now, given enough time, the fungus working on this wood, of course, would break the wood down and it would fall apart. But um, when you see this in the forest, usually there's big pieces of wood, very well rotted, and it's like aquamarine color, right? It looks like it's been spray painted. Well, that fell off of a log or something that also has the fungus in it, but how would you know? I mean, the wood's still intact, so only when it starts falling apart do you and I see it. So that's what, that's uh, my, the point is the, the person that knew about this wood had to see the signs of it before it started falling apart. Okay, so there's other, other things uh, right around your house that are hidden in plain sight. Who's ever heard of this fungus here, Lophodermium pinastri? Nobody. It's probably the most common fungus on the planet. It's around your house. Who's ever seen it? It's really tiny. Its whole reason for being uh, pinastri, so this implies it lives in, in pines or associated with pines. Its whole reason for being is it lives inside of pine needles. And no one's really sure if it's a parasite or a pathogen or an endophyte. It's probably more likely to be an endophyte and maybe even benefit the tree in some way. Uh, what is known is when the needles fall off the tree, that's when you might happen to notice it because then it goes into sexual reproduction and makes its, these little fruit bodies, which are super, super tiny, these little black pustules. Is that a bug? A bug. Is it a bug? 
bunt? It's not a bunt, no. It's, it's a lophodermium, binastri. I already told you that. No, okay, so Ken asked if it's a bunt. Bunts are a type of fungus that attack uh, cereal grasses, like, like carnal bunt. Yeah, well, there's a lot of fungi that have pustules like this. But what's, uh, what's really exciting about this are at the little red arrows. So this guy is rots woody debris, in this case, these little tiny pine needles, but it also does this spalting reaction, which again, walls off its turf from all the others. If you see at each one of these red arrows, these perfectly straight, in most cases, black line all the way across the needle. So this, this colony in here is one fungus, over here's a different fungus. Here's another spalted line, another one, and they're all over the place. Isn't that wild? So you probably have pine needles around your house right now, and you could go check, and you'll be amazed this is on them. It's super common. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Exactly, yep. Yeah, so, you know, they're going into sexual reproductive mode here, so the mating and the, the, the crossing, you know, might be happening between this one and this one, but when it comes time for feeding, uh, you know, they're, they're eating off of a different dinner plate. They're, they're keeping things separate. So isn't that well? And you can see how tiny these are. Okay, so some other, um, some other fungal basics here. Oh, so I mentioned what we had learned, if we learned anything at all about fungi, is that they rot things. Turns out that's not really totally true. Most fungi actually are biotrophs. And so what is made, uh, meant by biotrophs? They're symbionts. So I point this out because um, a lot of times you'll hear the word symbiont used in news media or other sources to mean uh, things that are mutually beneficial. Uh, but that's not actually what the word means. Symbionts in, in nature are just organisms whose lives are basically in, intimately intertwined. So pathogens, which you know, may kill their host, pathogen and host, they are symbionts. Their lives are both uh, intimately associated. Um, if you're beneficial, then you're considered a mutualist. So uh, most fungi are, are no doubt biotrophic, and probably most of those, believe it or not, are probably parasites. In fact, probably most life on the planet is a parasite, believe it or not. You can do this by simple math, just by saying, well, however many species there are, each one of those probably has at least one species-specific parasite, right? And that's kind of simple-minded, so let's just say everybody has two species-specific parasites, and very quickly you see that most life on the planet is a parasite. So it doesn't mean they're bad, it's just, that's just what they do. And uh, there's no groups of organisms that are not targeted by fungi. So of course we know about fungi that attack plants and humans, but there's fungi that attack all kinds of things, other fungi, even uh, slime molds. So here's a really cool slime mold that I see maybe once a year. It's this really pretty violet color. Uh, uh, it, it, but it's a slime mold that's been attacked by a fungus. The fungus is Nectriopsis violacea. Have you ever seen this before in a club foray? I guarantee you have it down here. So it's often kind of a gray color, but when it's fresh, it's very pretty uh, purple-violet. And this was, this was a type of um, fuligo slime mold, which is super common in Missouri in the summertime. Super, super common. Um, and it, uh, f these fuligos have been collected for like centuries. There were collections of them. And every once in a while, this gray or purple variety would end up by the slime mold experts in collections. And when this fungus was first uh, described not all that long ago, they started going back in collections and found, oh, it had been collected lots and lots of times, but people thought it was just a weird purple form of the slime mold. They didn't realize what they were actually were looking at was the fungus on top of the slime mold. Isn't that cool? So I think it's called like the slime mold eater or something like that, but it's um, super pretty. Uh, there's uh, fungi that attack other fungi, of course. There's other fungi that don't really attack fungi so much, just their spores. So here's a really cool uh, fungus that's an eater of spores and nothing else called Sporophagomyces. So basically spore eater fungus. So when you're doing a foray out in the woods and people are bringing in all kinds of moldy gross things and you're like smacking it out of their hands saying, what are you doing? You're embarrassing yourself, bring in nice fresh stuff. Well, sometimes things look moldy because they're old. Sometimes they look moldy because there's actually something growing on top of them. So the next time someone brings in a Ganoderma or some other conch, and it has this mold on the bottom, if it's not riddled with bug holes and really light, like it's rotten, if it's nice and heavy and, and fresh, you might wonder why there's a mold on it. Well, it very well could be this guy here. 
This picture was taken just a couple years ago at a foray with the Illinois Club, and I'm sure it's seen a lot more often, but people just toss it because they think it's a moldy Ganoderma. But it's actually very exciting. What happens is this fungus attaches to the side of the conch, and these, these conchs are perennial, so they live year after year after year and keep putting on a new spore layer and getting bigger and bigger. Well, the fungus attaches to the side and kind of creeps across on the underside, and as the spores rain down, it catches those and feeds on them and, and seemingly nothing else. Isn't that an interesting way to make a living? Pretty cool. Has anyone ever heard of this fungus before? That's why you gotta get this book. <laughs> okay, so is, the, is Last of Us still a thing? When The Last of Us came out, I think like a year ago, everyone was asking me to make sure and talk about zombie fungi in the talk because that's all anyone wants to know about. So I just left this in here because in case um, people are still watching. Did everyone see Last of Us? Some a little bit. I actually didn't see any, but I saw some pictures uh, from, you know, from the episodes that looked intriguing enough, I guess. Um, anyways, so The Last of Us is about a situation where there are these zombifying cordyceps like fungi that I guess have figured a way to attack humans, which is a little far-fetched. I mean, come back in a few million years and it might be true, but so far as we know, there's nothing like that now. However, uh, most other arthropod groups do get attacked by these sorts of fungi, and they form all of these really pretty uh, fruit bodies and structures. These are some pictures from a good friend of ours, Dan Winkler, who goes to the tropics and sees these things, and he goes into the Himalayas and sees them. No groups of arthropods seem to be um, immune to these different types of cordyceps fungi. And, you know, they, they kill the bug. This is an ant here. This picture is actually upside down. It should be the other way. It should be like aimed downwards. Anyways, these things get inside of uh, insects and other arthropods, and then they make a fruit body. It's really not too much to look at and not super exciting. But if you know what's going on, that's where the excitement is. Because the spores get inside of the creature, uh, lives there for a long period of time, basically uh, digesting parts of the creature, but without affecting the brain or certain other important uh, things that can, organs and things like that that control the organism. Then when it's time to go into sexual reproductive mode, then the fungus produces hormones and other things that directs the movement of the arthropod to go into a place, in the case of ants, uh, right above the ant colony, where it will rain spores down on them. Or in the case of uh, cordyceps of caterpillars and things like that, it'll direct them to pupate by digging into the soil and orienting in a certain way. How the fungi get inside the organisms, I mean, it's postulated that somehow the spores land on them or they breathe them in. I mean, it's not really very well known. Uh, but just recently, there was some discoveries that are starting to get closer to figuring this out. But before we get to that, here's what's going on in that picture with that uh, gruesome ant. So uh, just like in The Last of Us, these stalks were coming out of people's necks. So the fungus is all over inside the ant, except for in the brain. And then when it's reproducing, it produces this uh, stalk out of the neck with this knob here, this stroma. And so the stroma is where the spore producing parts of the fungus is. The fungus is an ascomycete. So uh, kind of a close relative of, say, like a dead man's finger or something like that, where you have stromal tissue with these sort of uh, flask sort of structures buried inside of this tissue. Wherever these bumps are, that's an opening for one of these flasks. So these flasks are called parathesia. Inside the parathesia are where the asci are. Each ascus makes the ascospores, and they're blasted out one of those, the holes in one of those bumps. So that's what's, this, uh, what's going on in this uh, crazy stalk here. And this is the cordyceps that's also probably familiar to you even if you don't know too much about fungi because this is a really important eastern medicine that's collected in the Himalayas every year. This is a fungus that attacks uh, this other group of arthropods, um, lepidopterans, so um, moths and butterflies, and attacks them in their larval stage. And then when it's time for this thing to produce this stalk and fruit, it again uh, tells the uh, caterpillar to dig down a certain way and at a certain depth. It normally would uh, aim head down, but when it's been attacked and zombified, it actually is aimed head up because that's more convenient for this fungus to grow out through the soil and produce this stalk where the ascospores are made. So, and again, it's always been wondered, how the heck can this, this thing find these caterpillars? <laughs> Furthermore, um, this 
this structure here, this whole fruit bud here, this Yartsa Gumba, as it's called, when it's the season, basically everybody in Tibet and parts of Nepal go into the mountains to collect these things. So in fact, um, the Tibetan Autonomous Region, which is a really large part of China, the entire economy is based on this. So like 75% of the entire economy is this, that. So the, this is then this this is dried and then used in lots of Asian medicine. You can, uh, if you go into an Asian herb shop in St. Louis, you probably would see them for sure. In Chicago, you'll see them in uh, in Chinatown for sure. And it's uh, believed to have a, a lot of medicinal properties to uh, cure all sorts of different um, things. In any case, uh, when these things are dried, I mean they don't weigh a whole lot. So a stack of them. Uh, by weight, if you had a stack that weighed, let's say, a kilo versus a kilo of gold, this would cost, be worth a lot more money than gold by weight. So if you're imagining something with billions of these being collected, uh, something like out of the Wild West where people with AK-47s are armed and guarding the buying and selling, that's exactly what it looks like in Tibet where people earn you know, a few hundred dollars a year. There's people with stacks of these and, and worth millions and millions of dollars. So it's a really kind of weird situation that's uh, got a lot of people worried maybe they will get over harvested and go extinct. I'm not sure it's gonna happen, and here's why. So as these, as these caterpillars get rarer and rarer, you would think it'd be harder and harder for the spores of the fungus to find a host and complete its life cycle. Except that just a few years ago, it was discovered that Besides living inside of this bug, this fungus also lives in a lot of the plants too. All the time, it's always in the plants. That's probably how the caterpillar is getting the fungus inside of its body, by eating the plant. Yeah, so the spores probably have no function at all, maybe, I don't know. Um, so anyways, what this means is even without the caterpillar, the fungus will probably continue to do just fine. But for me, what's really amazing is to think that for an entire season, this fungus can live inside of an animal and do all kinds of animal physiological things, direct the animal to do whatever, not get uh, discovered by the animal's immune system and killed, all these sorts of things. It can do all these animal things, even though it's a fungus, inside of an animal. The rest of its life, it's living maybe for years or decades inside of plants doing animal, doing plant things, probably creating uh, plant hormones and and evading detection of the plant or maybe benefiting the plant. So again, this was just discovered not all that long ago, so um, the next research, hopefully we'll, we'll be finding out what this thing's doing inside of the plant. Pretty cool story. These things attack all sorts of uh, animals I've shown, but they also attack different types of fungi. So here's a, a deer truffle, so different groups of cordyceps attack the fruit bodies of, of fungi. So this is a deer truffle, Elaphomyces, so this fungus is called a Laphocordyceps or a Telepocladium. Has anyone ever found these before? They're actually really, really common. All kinds of cordyceps are common in nature. Nobody really sees them because they're really small. If they're sticking up out of the soil, they look about like a, kind of like a, a matchstick. They're really tiny and you're out in the forest looking for big mushrooms. Usually when you see them is in a really, really droughted year and people are desperate for any mushroom at all. They're crawling around big stumps and logs where there might be some moisture. And then all of a sudden you see all these little things sticking up and usually the collector doesn't know what they are so they just grab them and pull them up and it's like, oh, look what I found. Well, if you, if you have someone that knows what to look for and they see this, you know, this doesn't look like much sticking out of the soil. But if you know enough about what it is, you can dig down beneath it and see this yellow uh, rhizomorph and then also dig up the host as well to the joy of your uh, mycophilic compatriots. They'll celebrate you and, and carry you off the foray uh, on a dais because these are always really cool to see. Uh, really none of this is, is edible. Deer truffles aren't edible. I guess the, the cordyceps is probably edible, but they're so small, I don't know really why anyone would want to, but they're just really cool to see in nature. And of course, the deer truffle is mycorrhizal, so it's uh, hooked up as a biotroph on trees in the area. So everything's all connected here. Here's another laugh of cordyceps on a, on a, on a uh, different uh, type of deer truffle that's been excavated, so pretty cool. And I'm not sure what that's duplicated. Oh, so it's hard to believe, as all these zombify fungi are, and that they attack all these different groups of insects, this whole thing has actually evolved more than once. So a lot of the lower fungi that are basically zygomycetes, they've figured out ways to kill insects as well. Now's the time when you'll probably see these things in your house. 
when flies and things are on the windowsill or on the window trying to get out, it's warm in your house, so they come in. Um, you'll soon see them like dead and stuck to your window. Has anyone ever seen one before? Yeah, dead and stuck to your window or even on the windowsill, and there'll often be all, all kinds of white dust around them or all of this dust on them. What's happening is the, it had been zombified by an entomophthora, an insect destroyer, that's what that word means, entomophthora. Uh, an entomophthora species that gets inside of the fly, you know, it t tells it to fly up as high as possible because that's beneficial for the fungus, presumably, uh, because then their spores are launched into the air. So if you see something stuck to the window with white powder around it, you know, the fly wasn't flying so fast that it like crashed into the window and stuck. I mean, that's, that'd be ridiculous. Um, it's, it's been killed by another one of these type of uh, fungi. And here's some other things to look for. Has anyone ever seen this order of fungi? Labulbiniales. Labulbiniales. Has anyone ever heard of these? This is probably the biggest group of fungi we know. And, and nobody knows anything about them. Because again, they were just discovered recently. Basically, they're these super tiny little fungi that live on the exteriors of insects. And this is the, this is the shells covering the wings. So this isn't connected to the body. You know, they'll lift these shells up and the wings are underneath and the body is underneath that. They're just attached to the uh, exterior of the fungus uh, and or exterior of the insect. And I guess maybe they eke out some sort of an existence from them. They're only about two or a few cells uh, bigger in size. And they ride around on these fungi and that's just what they seemingly do. Um, if you're wondering what the heck is on the cover of this, that's what the surprise is. This issue is devoted to Labulbiniales and these weird, weird fungi that nobody really knows much about. So when they are, when new species are discovered, it's usually in museum collections of insects and other arthropods. People are studying them and they're like, oh, this one was close, this species is closely related to this one, but it has like slightly different antennae. Well, a mycologist comes along and is like, um, those are not antennae, those are fungi. And this sort of thing happens all the time, believe it or not. It was even happening during the pandemic lockdown. Scientists were still working. They took stuff home, and now they're communicating with mycologists via Zoom. And so there are species named like Twitter eye, Zoomy eye, et cetera, because they were identified during lockdown. And a lot of them were, were fungi found in insect collections. Isn't that pretty cool? Uh, some quick notes on uh, some other symbioses. Uh, and this involves mycorrhizal situation. These are the fungi that are basically farming trees and other plants. Um, these are uh, becoming pretty well known, so just a couple slides on this. But I do want to point out that um, uh, where they live on the roots of trees, you can actually see the fungi that are s attached to the tree and then, of course, attached to mushrooms fruiting out here. Um, it's really hard to see in big trees, but if you have little seedlings or, or weed seedlings on your property, that's a lot easier to visualize these things. These are bristlecone pines that I uh, poached from New Mexico and was gonna plant them at my house in Illinois. And before I did, I just uh, wiped away some of the soil from all of the root tips of these guys. And you can see they look moldy. They're not rotting uh, because of mold. They're, that's the mycorrhizal fungus there. That's what's leading to the life of this bristlecone pine because these fungi are attached to trees all tree species have them, and the fungus goes out into the soil, brings in the nutrients and the water to the tree. And we know that it's an obligate association because trees uh, grown in places that don't have their specific mycorrhizal partners can't be grown. Um, there's pictures like this in all sorts of different textbooks. They always show uh, seedlings of, of trees grown against a glass plate. And what this shows is the advantage of having a mycorrhizal partner on your root. And these little pine seedlings, the roots of the tree go right to here. They go right to here. All the rest of this is not plant. This is all fungus. That's all the mycorrhizal fungus. So you can see it dramatically increases the, the surface area of the roots. If you've dug up trees or planted trees at your house, fruit trees or whatever, you've seen there's not much to a root. It's just like a naked stem that kind of gets smaller and smaller and pretty much just functions to hold the tree down so it doesn't blow away. It's relying on a fungi in the soil that partner with the tree to actually do all the heavy lifting of bringing in the nutrients and the water to the plant. And what the fungus gets back from the plant is carbohydrates. The plant can photosynthesize and it passes these goodies on to the fungus. And so both uh, are partners in, in this relationship and mutualistic. 
And so we know there's a lot of fungi that do this. In fact, most of the fungi that are most interesting to us, most of the bigger mushrooms, uh, all are mycorrhizal, which means you can't grow them. They are growing from a host. They're not growing from the soil, they're growing from the, the roots of trees. So truffles and rushulas and lactarius, ammonitas, these are all mycorrhizal. Cortinarius, which is another huge group, uh, trichilomas like matsutake, um, um, lacarias, of course, uh, just about all the boletes seem to be mycorrhizal, and chanterelles, all of our favorite edibles. And even some, even some more else seem to be mycorrhizal too. Why is that guy smiling? <laughs> yeah, this is Willie May in his natural state with big piles of morels around him. Yeah, that looks like Wisconsin too, doesn't it? Yeah, you probably did. Anyways, so um, if you don't know about mycorrhizal fungi, find out because um, pretty much all groups of plants except maybe the mustard family rely on them and for sure all trees. They all have this obligate a partnership with fungi. So 90% or more of all plant species and probably 100 species of trees. Um, lots of basidiomycetes and ascomycetes as well. The mycorrhizal situation, it's sort of a parasitism. The fungus attacks the roots of the plant, but it's a parasitism where both uh, partners of this, of this biotrophic situation benefit. And again, it's evolved numerous times. So it's not like, oh, someone figured out mycorrhizal now all of the ones after that are mycorrhizal. It's evolved numerous times. Orchids have their own special type of mycorrhizal situation and, um, and on and on. There's a lot of different groups that seemingly have hit upon this idea. If you want to know about orchids, there's, there's someone here I can set you up with. One of the world's authorities on orchids is in the front row. So there's some other things going on here that uh, at first glance, you're like, ah, well, that's a bolete, and I've seen this before, and I knew it was mycorrhizal. That's why uh, Gyrodon merulioides is known as the ash bolete. You'll find it in the fall around ash trees, or at least you used to until they all got uh, killed by the uh, emerald, bark, emerald uh, ash borer. Um, so you always saw this around ash trees. It's a bolete. It's mycorrhizal. Well, here's the thing. It's actually not a bolete. And it's actually not mycorrhizal with the ash trees, but it is always associated with the ash trees. Again, there's a lot of things about fungi hidden right in plain sight. White ash trees, upper Midwest, until the beetles came through, probably the most common tree in neighborhoods and around uh, urban areas. Super common, this mushroom super, super common. You've seen this down here. So what's that, gonna, what's that mushroom gonna do now? Go extinct, just like its host. So, if you found this around white ash trees, you knew it was a bully and you knew it was mycorrhizal. Again, you were wrong on both counts. But here's what, here's what could have happened. If you were digging around, uh, so this picture was taken in Denver. Uh, I, I stopped in someone's yard to dig these up to show some people. Uh, the homeowner wasn't too happy. And this, is, this was from somewhere else. But as you're digging them up, if you look at the base of this uh, mushroom, you'll see these little black peas. That's what the mushrooms attached to, these little black peas. But actually, it is the mushroom. So those ash trees have a specific kind of an aphid that's sucking the juices out of the tree. It's the only thing this aphid does. It lands on the tree, climbs down, it mates, climbs down, uh, crawls under the soil, attaches to the root, and starts sucking. This fungus is there in the soil and builds a gall around this aphid. Without the fungus, the aphid wouldn't be able to survive because something else would come along and kill it. So the fungus actually builds a gall and entombs this aphid. There's an aphid inside there. The aphid's attached to the tree, sucking juices. The tree, uh, the fungus is sucking juices from the aphid. So there's uh, sort of a, a three-way partnership here. Isn't that wild? Did the aphid die then? No, the aphid's still alive. It's, it's protected by the fungus, yeah. But it's, but it's, it's in prison. It is imprisoned. Well, there's all kinds of organisms imprisoned inside you right now, but not in me, but inside you. So just um, two short stories. Oh, am I about what, one hour? I'm, yeah, I'm almost at one hour. Two short stories, and one has a tie-in with St. Louis. So um, there's, a, believe it or not, there's a number of times that fungi have altered the course of world history. There's been world leaders that have been 
accidentally poisoned and killed, some that have been intentionally poisoned and killed. One of the Caesars in, in Italy was intentionally poisoned and killed by mushrooms. I'm not going to talk about that because everyone's heard those stories. But here's a couple other cool stories. So what are those? Now, how did you know that? Potatoes don't look like that. Do they look like that in your store? So wild type potatoes uh, apparently do look like this. And so from some of these are potatoes we eat now. So in places where potatoes are native, they collect all sorts of different uh, tuber species and they have all of these various shapes and, and whatnot. Anyways, the tie-in with St. Louis, the tie-in with St. Louis is that in uh, the 18, middle 1800s, St. Louis, like most cities in the US, were still quite small and had this major influx of immigrants from Europe, especially Ireland and, Ireland and especially Germany, but a lot of other parts of Europe as well. There were wars and things going on, of course, there always have been, but the biggie was the so-called Irish potato famine hit. This was caused by what was thought to be a fungus at the time, it's sort of a fungus-like organism, and it wiped out potatoes. And basically everyone survived on potatoes. It was the main source of uh, carbohydrates and calories for almost everybody, not just in Ireland, but Germany, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, everywhere. So it caused widespread famine. In fact, the, the, we know about the situation in uh, Ireland. Uh, yeah, Irish potato. We know about the situation in Ireland, and it's called the Irish potato famine because that's where it was especially bad. So... Um, about a third or 20% to a third of the population starved to death and about 25% to a third of the population left and moved other places, not just North America, uh, Australia and other places as well, have a, have a lot of Irish immigrants and a cop on every, Irish cop on every street corner as they say, because of this episode. To this day, the population of Ireland has still not fully recovered. The population in Ireland now is less than it was in the middle 1800s, believe it or not. It was because of this fungus. And so it led to places like um, Cincinnati, where I'm from, and St. Louis as well, to have these huge influx of German uh, people and German food and German-style beer. Wherever the Germans went, they set up brewing. St. Louis has huge brewing history. Cincinnati does too, Milwaukee, all because of the Germans. So isn't that pretty amazing? So what's go what happened? Well, here's what happened. There's this uh, organism, Phytophthora infestans, that causes late blight of potato. This is a field that's been hit by late blight. It almost looks like these green potato plants are just like rotting, the leaves like rotting right off of them. If you were standing in this field 48 hours before that, before this picture was taken, there was no sign of disease whatsoever, not even a black spot. When the organism lands in the field and gets going, it's extremely fast how, it, how quickly it spreads. Every few hours, it reproduces and sporulates and, and attacks new plants. Um, so the only way to stop it is to know when it's coming and to prevent it. You can't stop it once, once it's happened. And it's been very hard to control. It's still very hard to control to this day. Well, well what, what happened? How did this become such a big deal with potatoes in Europe, etc.? And why wasn't it ever a problem with the people growing potatoes before that? Well, everyone just assumed that potatoes, of course, come from the Andes Mountains of South America, fairly high elevation. Everyone assumed until very recently that there was no Phytophthora there because it's too cold or it's too high or uh, too high up or something. I, we don't really know. But that's actually not the case. Here's what actually happened. So potatoes were taken from the, from the New World in South America to Europe and they became a big hit. Late blight of potato, the Phytophthora, does not occur here. It occurs in, in, in Northern Americas, in North America and Central America. So uh, when, when Europeans came back to the New World to set up colonies in North America, that's when this uh, pathogen, Phytophthora infestans, which attacked other solanaceous plants, but not potato, because there was no potato, that's when it jumped onto potato and really, really liked it, because there were no other pathogens that were attacking potato. So, of course, there's trade back and forth. So now potatoes and other things grown <clears throat> in the New World go back to the Old World. Potato with the late blight pathogen goes back to Europe, and now it goes haywire spreading because, again, uh, all the potato there are basically one type of potato, one variety, you know, because all kinds of species here, lots and lots of varieties, basically one type was taken here, so it's a monoculture. So the ones that were really good at attacking it here, they go back and now they, they went haywire. But something else happened. 
So only one of the two mating types made it to Europe. For like 100 years, there was no sexual reproduction in Phytophthora infestans. So they could sort of control it by finding uh, resistant plants, using some uh, antifungal chemicals, et cetera, et cetera. No resistance was happening in, phyt in the Phytophthora because they only had one of the two mating types in Europe. Again, for like a century until I think it was the 80s, that's when the second mating type actually made it to Europe and now sexual reproduction happened, and so all kinds of new varieties that are much more pathogenic. So the fact that potatoes were wiped out in Europe, actually it's still an ongoing problem there and in North America. So potatoes in, in the New World are grown mostly in uh, Wisconsin, Michigan, Maine, uh, Pennsylvania, and Idaho. That's, those are the big potato growing states. And those are all mostly chip type potatoes, so the red ones or the round ones. The russet Burbanks, most of those are grown in Idaho, where they still don't have potato light blight and they try to keep it out. And likewise, it's also a little colder there, et cetera, et cetera. But it's still becoming a very big problem and probably why a lot of the potato chip companies have slowly tried to, to get you interested in other kinds of vegetable chips like taro and carrot. Who the hell would eat a carrot chip when you have delicious potato chips? Someday in the future, there may not be potato chips, and I'm not kidding, so by that time, you'll be accustomed to eating other kinds of chips. But what's uh, for sure known is that farmers that grow potatoes, it's like the cheapest crop in the store, isn't it? The cheapest food in the store. Potatoes are the most expensive crop to grow in North America. Isn't that crazy? Uh, so farmers in Maine or Wisconsin have been growing potatoes for like five generations. The more they grow potatoes, the more they go into debt because they basically lose money every single year because they have to be constantly spraying before the late blight starts up to keep it at bay. Yeah, so if you, as hard as it is to believe this, this is what I, I did my postdoc on, as hard as it is to believe this, that people would continue to do that, if you know anyone that farms for a living, no matter what it is, just talk to them and they'll probably say, yeah, most types of farming, you don't make any money, you often lose money a lot, but if you know potato farmers, they will tell you this. Every, every one of them says we do it because that's what we've always done and we love doing it, we want to be on the land, but it's uh, e extremely expensive. So potatoes are on the list of the dirty dozen, the things that you're supposed to eat uh, organic. Do you think that they're, they're growing them organically? Uh, it's possible, but it, uh, if you, I mean, I, I, you can grow potatoes at your house and not spray them. And, and I do, and they're delicious. But to grow them commercially, uh, they spray like seven, eight, nine times. Yeah, versus other things that don't need to be sprayed. So yeah, dirty, again, the, the upper part of the plant gets most of the spray, so I don't know how much, if anything, gets on the tubers. I can't really say there, but for sure it's, uh, it's astounding. It's astounding how much it costs to grow them versus how cheap they are in the store. So the other thing about potatoes, of course, if you are buying potatoes now or in the spring, I mean, those potatoes have been in storage for a year, right? You know that. They harvest potatoes in the fall. They don't harvest them in the spring in North America. So there's these massive warehouses that are like the size of airplane hangers that are full of potatoes and filling up right now. Okay, one, one last story. So this happened in the past, but really is still affecting us to this day and really could come back to be a problem. Here's something that's been around forever and it's become a really huge problem like right now. Oh, and I'm out of time. No, okay, I have enough time to tell you. Have you ever heard of this before? Coffee or rust? Yeah. Okay, so potato, cheapest thing to buy, but it's the most expensive to grow. The crops worth the most money in the world are uh, coffee and weed. Those are probably the two most commercially uh, important crops. Okay, so coffee rust is a fungus that attacks the coffee plant. What's going on here? Well, when coffee plants uh, get attacked by this rust fungus, they get defoliated, um, the leaves and things fall off, so obviously the plant produces less, but th with this happens uh, season after season, the plant gets weakened and dies. The fungus uh, lives inside of the leaves, uh, comes out the stomates and produces spores, which blow and splash around and in infect other types of, of uh, the adjacent plants. So here's what's happening. So believe it or not, but before British became the famous tea drinkers that they are, British were actually coffee drinkers. Everyone drank coffee. And they grew all of their tea, or they grew all of their coffee in basically a big giant plantation that was India. British India and Ceylon were where all the coffee was grown. Coffee was discovered 
its center of origin is in northern Africa. So like Ethiopia, that's where coffee comes from. There's several species of coffee there. Uh, Robusta is one and Ar Arabica is the other. You've heard of those two types of coffee. They're different species. So anyways, um, when the coffee rust fungus, which was never really a big problem here because there's lots of species, lots and lots of varieties, it's native there and so are the plants, never a big problem. When they took one single type to British India and are growing coffee from it, um, well now it's a big problem because uh, the fungi home in on that and wiped it out. So all of coffee was wiped out in the 1800s. The British still need some sort of caffeine fix, so they switched to tea. So to this day, this is all tea production everywhere, and the British famously drink tea now. So people that still wanted to grow and sell coffee, well, you just have to move it to a place where there's no coffee rust fungus. So from, from British India, moved to uh, Indonesia like Java, which is why coffee is called Java, Papua New Guinea, moved it to uh, other parts of Africa. Everywhere it went, everywhere the plants went, the fungus went and continues to wipe out the coffee plants. There's one place that had never seen coffee rust before because there is no coffee plants there, and that's in the Americas. So um, coffee then was taken in the late 1800s and grown in places like Colombia, Brazil, Mexico, Central America, where it's still grown to this day. And in fact, most coffee in the world comes from there, as well as Vietnam and a couple of the places are the biggest coffee exporters. So, of course, coffee rust could never come there because they were going to be very diligent, make sure to keep it out, except, of course, it's going to make it there. Yeah, so 1970s, coffee rust showed up and there was no way to control it. It moved on up through South America and into Central America, into Nicaragua and Honduras and, and places like that. So, what's going on? So, this is still, is there one more slide? No. So, there, this is still a huge problem right now. Those uh, caravans coming northward from Central America to the U.S. border, this is why. So, um, you know, the, the news will tell you they're coming, they're wanting to, uh, these migrants are wanting to come, these immigrants are wanting to come to North America to find a better job and a better way of life, which is true. But the whole reason that they're coming is because there are no jobs in Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, uh, the, these, these El Salvador, these countries' economies is entirely on coffee. And in the 1970s, when coffee rust hit and really got going in the 80s, um, the first really big outbreak in a lot of regions, 50 to 80 percent of the crop was wiped out. And then it happened again the next year. And the next year. So, uh, you know, entire communities, the entire country had really very little source of income and, and jobs, so people started moving northward. So you don't often hear about what the reason why the people don't have jobs, but this is actually, this is a fungus causing a, uh, changing the course of human history. So is this still a big problem? It's still a very big problem, although now we're a couple decades on and there are resistant varieties that work, resistant varieties of, of coffee that work to some extent, but the problem is, is that it takes five or more years before a plant starts producing coffee. So in the meantime, well, people have moved on. I mean, they can't be waiting around if they're a coffee picker uh, or if they run the bodega where all the coffee pickers come in and eat and drink. I mean, they can't be waiting around. So a lot of people have lost their jobs and moved on. So I think the problem will get resolved, but the fungus for sure will never go away. You'll never be able to defeat it. And of course, new strains of the fungus come out that can uh, break through the resistance of the plant. So this is going to be something going on forever. But I just wanted to point this out that um, a lot of times when you hear a story on the news, it's oversimplified about why something's happening. You know, there's like a, a sound bite and things usually aren't so simple. And in this case, it's actually because of a fungus, believe it or not. So next time you're um, drinking your coffee, um, food for thought. So I think now I've gone a couple minutes over. So yeah, so that will be the end. So Thanks very much for your time.